All right, let's get started for today. So a couple of announcements. Homework one, search has been released. After today's lecture, you should be able to solve all the problems in there. Um, project one, search has been released. Same thing for that. After today's lecture, you should be able to solve all problems in there. Uh, make sure to start early on project one. It's longer than most because you'll have to get used to the code base that you'll be using for the Pac-Man environment. And so it'll be a little more startup time than for the other projects for you. Section, so section started this week. Um, we collected attendance numbers for each section and posted them on Piazza. So if you felt like your section was overcrowded, check that post on Piazza. And you can see which sections might have less people and pick one of those next time. Any questions about logistics? All right, let's get started then. Um, graph search. So the search algorithms we've seen so far might consider the same state twice. And so you might end up doing some redundant work. So let's see how we can avoid that. So here's a state space graph shown on the left. Let's think about what the search tree would look like for this state space graph. Okay, let's say the start state is this state over here. Then if we expand this from A, we can go to B in two ways, because there are two actions that get us to B. From B, there are two actions that get us to C and so forth. And what we see is that the deeper we go in the graph, and then in the search tree, the more repetitions we see of the same state. And the tree search algorithm we've seen so far doesn't take advantage of the fact that there is repetition to avoid redundant work. And that's what we're going to look at now. So let's look at um, breadth first search. And so we've seen tree search in the form of depth first, breadth first, uniform cost, greedy, and A star. And for all five of those, we'll now see a new version, the graph search version, which does one thing just a little differently. Okay. So let's look at. Um, the circled nodes in this search tree here, and ask ourselves the question, why, if we were to run breadth first search, could we skip over these nodes? Well, breadth first search is going layer by layer by layer. For this one here, E, we already have an E here. So by the time we get to this one in breadth first search, we've already expanded this E, anything underneath here is identical to anything underneath here. So it's always going to be preferable to find a path that goes through this E over here rather than a path that goes through this E over here in the search tree. And we can safely skip expanding this E over here just because this is identical to the other subtree over there. And so we're not going to miss out on any states by skipping that second chance of expanding E. All that we get is the same paths expansions again, except that we started off with a longer path leading to E, so a less preferable path. So the idea for graph search is to never expand a state twice. Okay? So how to implement this? We have already seen tree search. In addition to what you had there, you keep track of a set of expanded states, which we call the closed set. We still run tree search the way we normally run it, but before we expand the node, we check the last state in that node, see if it's already been expanded. How do we check that? We just have to check whether it's in our closed set or not. If it's in our closed set, we skip over it and we don't call the successor function to expand it and move on. If it's not in our closed set, that means it's the first time we'd expand it, we just expand it as usual and continue. So just a very minor change to tree search, but it can save you a lot of time because often there'll be multiple paths leading to 
a single state and now you do the work from that state onwards only once. One important implementational thing is that you should implement this closed set as a set, not as a list. Because you're going to be checking for membership, inserting things into the set. It's going to be faster if you have a data structure that implements a set rather than a list. Um, why is this emphasized so heavily here? As it turns out that old terminology used to call this a closed list. We're not calling it a closed list, but you might hear that in other places. It's really a set. It was just a bad name people had chosen in the past. Some of it still exists, but really it's a set and you should use a set. Can this wreck completeness? What do you think? So the question is, if our algorithm were guaranteed to find a solution if one exists, and now we switch from tree search to the graph search version, is it possible we now don't find a solution anymore all of a sudden? No, because whenever we skip something, that entire subtree that we skip, we're already going to visit somewhere else in the search tree. So we're not losing out on finding any states. How about optimality? Well, what were our optimal algorithms? We had uniform cost search and A star search. Um, we did ruin optimality of those algorithms. Over there. So I think we didn't ruin optimality of those algorithms. The reason is because we could have found an optimal solution as being the one with the lowest impact. And I, I see what you're basically saying there being the lowest impact, but the algorithm could have been the one with the smallest cost. And therefore, it was ruined. So the argument here was because we'll only expand it the first time we encounter the node, right? Correction theory argument? Yeah, sure. So, so if this is optimal just because it's the, it's the first encounter that might happen on the way through, right? It'll be a little bit more faster to get there. Okay, so the argument here is that we only expand the first time we encounter a state. Now, if the first time we reach the state, it was the optimal way, not reach, but the first time we pull a node that achieves a certain state, the first time we pull it from the fringe, the first time we pull it we reached it the optimal way, then it's all good, we're still optimal. But if the first time a state gets expanded, it was reached through a longer path than the optimal way to reach that state, then we might lose optimality, right? And so now we need to think about, can that happen? Is it possible that the first time we pull a state, we reached it in a suboptimal way? So for uniform cost search, we know that the first time will be the optimal time when we pull it, because when we pull it, it's the cheapest thing on the fringe, right? And so there's nothing cheaper left on your fringe. So in the future, you can never generate anything cheaper on your fringe, because anything you expand will put more expensive things onto your fringe. So for uniform cost search, we're good. But for A star, the story will be a little more subtle because the heuristic comes into play and how you prioritize which node you select first. And then it becomes a question, might that heuristic screw you over in some way where you now pull the something when it's not been reached optimally yet, and then skip over the time when it is reached optimally. So let's look at an example here. Here's a state space graph. Um, here are some heuristics. Let's see what happens if we run A star graph search. Okay, So we have initially just the start state on our fringe. We, we check, does it achieve the goal? No, we expand it. Now we have A and B on the fringe. We check which one has the best priority, that's B, priority of two. Pull that one from the fringe, does it reach the goal? No. Um, is it already in our close set? No. Um, so let's expand it, there we go. And so now we run graph search, we'll also have a closed set over here, S is in it by now, B is in it, right? Our fringe is now consisting of A and C. Um, we, we pull C, the node ending in C, because that's four, and the node ending in A is five. We check, does it achieve the goal? No. Um, 
Is it already in the closed set? No, so we expand and this is now adds C to our closed set and this is our fringe. We check our fringe, we see which is the cheapest according to the parity we use, that's SA. So we pull A from our fringe, we check does it achieve the goal? The answer is no. Then we check is it already in the closed set? The answer is no. So we expand and now we add A to our closed set. Now we have um, in our fringe C and G. C is the cheapest. So at the node SAC gets pulled from the fringe. We check. Um, does it achieve the goal? No. Is C in the closed set? Yes. So we actually stop here. We don't expand because it's already been expanded before. And then we go back, see what's in our fringe, just this node over here. Um, does it achieve the goal? Yes. And we declare success. We found the path that goes through B and C, which is this path over here, which is actually not the optimal path. If we check our heuristic, our heuristic is actually admissible. So we have an admissible heuristic, which was what we required last lecture. But since we changed from A star tree search to A star graph search, we lost the optimality guarantee here. In fact, it's not optimal what it returns. Yes. Go ahead. What's the of A star graph search or the point of studying AI? Um, I'd be happy to talk with you about that, but we're not going to get through lecture materials if we're going to discuss that now. <laughs> that was strange. Um, <laughs> okay, so what went wrong here? <laughs> Was here referring to. Um, okay, let's go back to graph search. If we had run tree search, we would have actually continued exploring this search tree. We would have made our way all the way down here, and we would have found the correct goal. In fact, it's the same goal, but a better path to that goal. So, um, our heuristic was admissible, still something went wrong. Let's take a closer look at what it is that went wrong here. So somehow we expanded this C before this C. We wish we would have expanded this C first, because that's the one for which we want to achieve the goal. But we went with the other one first. Why is that? Because in some sense this here was blocking us. We had a very high heuristic at A. One plus four, five was pretty high. That's why A didn't get pulled off the fringe. And we never saw that good C show up until we had already expanded the wrong C. And by that time it was too late for graph search to still get the right answer. So what's the problem here is that this four is too high in some sense, right? That's what's holding us back. The heuristic is holding us back there, but if we check h equal 4, cost of 1, cost of 3, it's actually admissible. So there's something more subtle going on here where it's actually not that it's too high in terms of estimating how far it would be to the goal, but in some sense too high in kind of how things work out relative to c. Admissibility only considers the heuristic relative to reaching the goal. But what went wrong was something relative to C, and it blocked us in terms of reaching C quickly enough. And so we'll need to look at something about heuristics that not just relates them to optimal cost to the goal, but also to other states in the graph. That property will be called consistency. So the main idea that we have is estimated heuristic cost must be smaller than actual costs. Um, so admissibility told us that we want the cost that we estimate be lower than the actual cost to the goal. 
here is a simplified case. We have just the node A, the node G, we have a heuristic of four, we have the node C still, and that's admissible. Now, if we add more heuristics here, so let's also look at the heuristic value at C because that will play a role in how this all adds up. Um, so what's our heuristic value at C? It's one. Our heuristic value at A is four. There's something unintuitive here. We think from A the cost would be four, maybe more, and we think from C the cost would be one, maybe, maybe more. But if we know that we're working with an admissible heuristic and heuristic at A is four and it only costs you one to go to C, then we know it's, it, one is too low an estimate at C. It, it drops too quickly. The cost will not drop that quickly. Once you only incur a cost of one, you know there's still a higher cost to go than just one, given you knew it was four when you started out at A. And so there's some inconsistency here between how we assign the heuristic value at A and how we assign the heuristic value at C. Question. Your intuition is exactly right, and this slide will build up exactly to that intuition that you're putting forward. So, great observation. So, the constraint we're going to impose is that the drop in heuristic value, HA minus HC, has to be smaller than the cost from A to C. So, if we wanted 4 at A, the drop and heuristic, heuristic at C is one, so um, the cost between them is one. So really, we're here right now, we have four, we have one, we have a minus here, and we have a one, small than or equal. This is not satisfied, so this consistency condition is not satisfied here. We're, we need something else than the heuristics we have to still guarantee our optimality. Okay, now if we make this two, then this will be satisfied and we won't have the problem that we had before of weird drops in heuristic leading to things being stopped on the queue for a long time before you finally get through them. So what's the consequence? The major consequence and the most important thing to keep in mind here that will achieve optimality for us even when using graph search is that if you require this property the F value along a path never decreases. Why is that? Okay. If you have an F value for a node that you pull from your fringe, if you call the successor function, you put a successor on the queue instead, right? Let's look at it for this particular case. The original F value, F of A, would have been G of A plus H of A then the successor f value, f of c, is equal to g of c plus h of c. Now, g of c will be equal to g of a, the cost to reach a, plus the cost from a to c, plus the heuristic at c. If we now compare f of a and f of c, if we ask ourselves the question, is f of A, not fully showing up, F of A, smaller than or equal to, keep disappearing on that side, is F of A smaller than or equal to F of C? That condition is the same as filling in these equations here, is G of A plus H of A smaller than or equal to G of A plus the cost from A to C plus H of C. Scratching out G of A on both sides, we see that the condition for consistency, which is shown here, is the same as the condition we have down here. So that condition is guaranteeing that whenever you put a successor on your fringe, 
the F cost of that successor will be higher than the F cost of its parent. All right, keep that in mind. So now we see whenever we pull things from the fringe, higher F cost will appear. So the next time you pull something from the fringe, it will have a higher F cost than anything you pulled before. Okay. So this will allow us to prove optimality. So tree search was already optimal. Okay. Let's imagine we run tree search with a consistent heuristic that we now know that if we were to run tree search with the consistent heuristics, nodes get expanded in order of increasing F values. Okay. What was the failure case we could encounter? That we expand the node when it's reached suboptimally, right? So we reach some state, it was some, with some path, but there will be a cheaper path later. That was the problem. Well, let's see if that can still happen. Um, let's say you reach the state you expanded it, much later, you put that state on the queue again, you pop it off. Well, we're guaranteed that now the F value of that state is higher than what we had before. Since the heuristic value doesn't change, it means that that later time, the cost to reach that state was higher. And so the later time was a worse way of reaching that state than what we had earlier on. So this property that F values keep increasing along paths guarantees that we never have the wrong expansion in terms of optimality. Okay, so we have now shown that A star free search is optimal. Last lecture, whenever the heuristic is admissible. Um, graph search um, is optimal whenever the heuristic is consistent, which is the, a condition on every edge, the heuristic, the value, how much the heuristic value drops has to be uh, less than how much the cost increases, or how much the cost is on that edge. Um, we know that we can translate that into F values will always be increasing along a path. Um, so that guarantees our graph search optimality for A star. You can work out some math that shows that these consistency conditions can be used by chaining them together to show that if a heuristic is consistent, it's also admissible. Um, it turns out that in practice, it tends to be easier to show admissibility because you just have to show some property related to cost to the goal. But there is a condition you can prove for, to prove consistency. It's that condition between heuristic values and costs for each uh, edge. Okay, so what's the summary? We looked at A star where we tried essentially to combine forward and backward costs in the right way. Um, depending on the kind of search algorithm we run, admissibility or consistency is required for optimality. Um, the heuristic design tends to be key, and a lot of your time spent in project one will be to come up with good heuristic values um, or heuristic functions. So thinking of relaxed problems is a really good thing to keep in mind, let's say ignoring walls or um, maybe ignoring other constraints on your actions that simplify the problem and allow you to find a better, a quick a solution more quickly to a simpler problem. Here's a pseudocode for tree search. We saw this last time. Here's a pseudocode for graph search. Um, the difference is just this thing here. When you expand, you added, that's expand the node, you add the last state of that node to the closed set, and you only expand when that state is not already in the closed set. Now, in your project one, we won't ask you to implement graph search because graph search is not a complete description of the algorithm. We'll ask you to implement depth first graph search, breadth first graph search, uniform cost graph search, and a star graph search. And some people will wonder, well, where's the pseudocode for depth first? Where's the pseudocode for breadth first? Where is the pseudocode for uniform cost search? Where is the pseudocode for a star? And that pseudocode is all here because the pseudocode is all the same for all of these. The only thing you do differently is your priority queue will use a different calculation of what priority means. It could be based on depth, deeper or shallower being better. It could be based on cost so far, or it could be based on cost plus heuristic value. But this here is your pseudocode for all of these. Okay, so here are some slides getting a little more detail if you want to work through a more detailed uh, 
uh, proof for why A star graph search is optimal, but keep in mind the intuition really is that your F values keep increasing along a path. And that ensures at a later time, you won't encounter something, some better way of reaching a state than you've already encountered before. Okay. Any lingering questions about A star graph search? Let's switch topics then and start looking at constraint satisfaction problems. Okay, so what is search for? So our assumptions have been we have a single agent, deterministic actions, everything's observed, discrete state spaces. And when we do planning, what we try to come up with is a sequence of actions. We essentially run in simulation what sequences of actions would result in and then pick a good sequence of actions from those simulated runs and execute that sequence of actions. Now, there are other problems that we might want to solve. Um, they're called identification problems. And it's where there's a set of variables. You want to find an assignment to that, each of the variables in that set such that some properties are satisfied for that assignment. This is still a search problem because you can think of every action that you take being making an assignment to a variable you have not assigned yet. And so your sequence of actions would be a sequence of assignments of values to variables. But it's a very special kind of search problem. Because usually when you have a sequence of actions, it actually matters in which order you execute that sequence of actions. But here it wouldn't, because you just assign a value to each variable. Now, other things that are very specialized about this that make it not just a generic search problem, but a specific class of search problems. And because it's such an important specific class of search problems, we're going to study them in more detail, come up with more specialized algorithms than the algorithms we've seen so far that can solve any search problem. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Um, so standard search problem, well, what I just said, you have a, some kind of state as a black box, call this can be any function over states, and successor function can also be anything. So we kind of have this generic process sequence of actions, and then some judge robot comes in at the end and says, well, the sequence of actions you came up with is no good, or it is good, and then you've achieved the goal state. CSPs, we're going to use a different formalism to define the problem. You could still use successor states and so forth, but we're gonna represent it slightly differently to take advantage of the details of this specific formulation. So we'll define our state always as a set of variables, xi, each of them having a domain of values it can take on. And the goal test will be a set of constraints specifying allowable combinations of values for subsets of these variables. Right? So an example we'll see a lot is map coloring. Right? And the problem there would be something where you say, can I color every territory slash state in this map while ensuring that no neighboring states have the same color? This is an example of what we'll be looking at of a formal representation language. It's something where you formalize your problem in some standard way that in principle then you could feed into a constraint satisfaction solver to solve your problem. Okay. So let's take a look at some example problems we'll formalize and then at some algorithms that are better than standard search algorithms. Okay, so here's the map coloring problem. How do we formalize this? First thing we need is a set of variables. So one choice for the set of variables is to say there's a variable associated with every state or territory. Um, then um, next thing to decide is what's the domain? What values can each variable take on? In this case, let's say we can only take on, use three colors, red, green, blue, and the domain of each variable is the same. But it is possible that your variables have different domains. That's okay too. Um, the constraints are that adjacent regions must have different colors. Um, there are two ways to formalize this. One way to formalize constraints is in an implicit way. Um, the implicit way is to have a function called that says, since, since for each constraint you'll have some kind of test, you can feed in your values of your variables and it'll return whether the test is satisfied or not. So here, implicit constraint is say, formulation is saying, is WA different from NT? If, if that's true, it's good. If that's not true, that's bad. An explicit way to define the same constraint is to essentially provide a set of values. It says the pair WA and T can take on as a pair the values red, green, 
or as a pair, the value is red, blue, and so forth. Um, any pair of colors that doesn't have a repeat of a color. If they're neighboring states, uh, if they're not neighboring states, they could take on any pair of values. A solution, what we want to return at the end is an assignment to each variable. And here's an example where all the constraints are satisfied. Okay, let's look at another example. So here's the end queens problem. The problem here is that you're given a chessboard and you're required to place queens on the chessboard such that none of them attack each other. So what you see here is an example solution to the problem. None of these queens can uh, strike each other in this configuration. Okay. Um, let's look at a first formulation. And this is typical for these constraint satisfaction problems. Often there are multiple ways to formalize them into, formalize your original problem into a CSP. So the first one could be have a variable for each location on the board, and then the values that they could take on are zero or one, signaling whether there's a queen on that spot or not. And then the constraints would say, well, um, for all i, j, k, this is, in this case, saying for each, if let's say i indexes over rows, then this would say we cannot have two on the same row. And let's assume j index is over columns. The next one is saying no two in the same column. And then the last two are saying no two in the same diagonal. Um, are we done here? Question not done yet. In fact, there's a very simple solution to this CSP, which is just assign zero to everything. Um, so you need one additional constraint, which says that you need to place four queens on the board or n for an n by n board. Um, now you might say, well, is this really the right way to formulate it? I don't know. It depends a bit on how you solve these problems, what the best formulation is to feed into your solver. Um, but it's definitely a somewhat redundant way to formulate it, right? Because you know this problem so well, you know never two in the same row, never two in the same column, you might take advantage of that in your formulation, right? So here's one way to do that. You have one variable per row, so a lot less variables, and that variable takes on takes on a value saying which spot in that row is occupied by the queen for that row. Okay. And now the constraints, in the implicit way, you have some function that says they're not threatening each other. Um, in the explicit way, you explicitly say, well, these values, pairs of values are compatible for assignments to row one and row two, and so forth. Now we don't need this sum constraint anymore because we're already saying that each row will get a queen assigned to it, so we already will automatically be assigning n queens in this problem. Now, at this point, we've looked at two specific examples of constraint satisfaction problems and how to formalize them. Um, we formalized them mathematically in a way that shows all the details. It turns out there's also going to be an intermediate formalization that will be useful to get intuition about the problem. Well, we don't show all the details, but we still show some of the specifics of the problem. They're called constrained graphs. So what's a constrained graph? It's a graph where um, every variable in your CSP is a node. And assuming, in this case, that there are only binary constraints, meaning the constraints only involve pairs of variables, you can draw your constrained graph by drawing an edge between each pair of variables for which there is a constraint. That's what's shown here. There are algorithms, which you'll see in next lecture, that take advantage of the structure of this graph to compute solutions more efficiently. And they can take advantage of the structure of that graph independent of exactly what constraint is sitting on each of these edges. They just look at the structure and based on that, can do something more efficient than if you weren't aware of the structure of this graph. Um, so we want to get used to seeing these graphs and saying, oh yeah, this encodes the Australia coloring problem. There are six nodes in the top part of the graph, one at the bottom, which is disconnected because it's not neighboring anything. So there's no constraint between that one and anybody else. You can already see here how that kind of splits your problem into two problems really. Um, but there will be more subtle ways to exploit the structure of the graph than just seeing that there are splits. So the next step, unfortunately, doesn't run on this latest machine of mine, but um, we'll show it through videos. 
Um, so what are we looking at here? This is a constrained graph for the five queens problem. So on the right, you see the five queens problem shown kind of five by five board. Um, there's a queen that you need to place in every row. And so we have, in this case, pairwise connections between all variables because any row, queen in any row is not supposed to attack a queen in any other row. And so we have a, sometimes a kind of a fully connected graph here uh, with constraints sitting on each of the edges. We'll get back to this later, um, but just keep this picture in mind for now. Let's look at another constraint satisfaction problem. This is a puzzle. Um, it says two plus two is four. Um, the type of puzzle here is one where you are supposed to replace these letters by digits. O would be any digit from zero through nine. W would be any digit from 0 through 9, and you want this summation to hold true. Right? That's the puzzle problem. It's a CSP. The variables are the um, letters plus these variables here, which are essentially the carry bits that you, if you sum O and O, you might not get R, but there might also be a carry here, X1. And when you sum these three, it's not just U, but there might also be a carry here. When you sum these three, it's not just O, but there might also be a carry here, X3. Okay. So while we only care about the first six variables, the other three are necessary to formulate our problem. The domains for these are zero through nine. Then the constraints, well, there's a constraint for each of these uh, columns essentially, which also includes the carry bit on the next column. Okay. So then in addition, you also have are required to assign all different digits. You can't just have them all be the same. Okay, let's take a look at what the constraint graph looks like for this type of problem. In this case, some constraints involve more than two variables. For example, here, four, um, three variables. So if we naively just draw edges between variables that participate together in constraints, we cannot tell the difference between having three separate constraints between each of the three pairs that we have here, that while having one joint constraint that involves all three of them. So just having edges between pairs of variables is not going to be enough to encode this piece of information. So we'll actually introduce a different kind of graph, it's called a factor graph. And rather than having regular edges for the constraints, we now have these rectangular boxes for each constraint. So this box here is signaling there's a constraint between O R and X1, which is this constraint shown over here. Okay. So it's a different kind of graph where constraints correspond to nodes, variables correspond to nodes, but ones are circles, the other ones are um, squares, and we connect them, connect every variable to the constraint that constraints it participates in. Okay, so here's another puzzle. Um, there's a lot of puzzles that are CSPs, it turns out. Here, it's Sudoku, question? So the question here was, how are we going to use this factor graph? And I'm going to have to defer that to the next lecture when we start taking advantage of graphs. Um, but as we present CSPs in this lecture, I want you to see how it can be represented as a graph. So you see the correspondence between the CSP and the graph, so you don't have to revisit all these CSPs next lecture. Um, so here's another one, Sudoku. So this is a kind of slightly harder puzzle maybe, depending on the level of Sudoku you're playing. Um, what's the puzzle here? You're supposed to fill in the empty squares with a digit from zero through nine. In any region here, you can only have each digit appear once in any Vertical column, you can have each digit appear only once, and in each horizontal, you can have each digit only appear once. Okay, so what does that look like in terms of constraints? It's an all-way diff that we have for each column, an all-way diff for each row, and then an all-way diff for each region. And if we hook that up to all columns, rows, and regions, we get the factor graph uh, representation for this constraint satisfaction problem. You can also do this differently by having constraints for, each, for pairs of variables and you'll have a lot more constraints. 
Um, it depends on your type of solver whether that makes a difference or not. Okay, here is another one. So this is one of the, from the old days of AI, people were trying to start to study computer vision. And they said, well, the essence in an image is kind of in the line drawing of the image. Because if we're trying to understand that there's a car there, whether it's silver colored, gold colored, red colored, and so forth, it doesn't really affect the fact that we think it's a car. It's really the shape, and the shape determines the edges essentially in the image. And so this kind of line drawing here would be a more abstract representation of that image. And they start studying, can we interpret line drawings? Um, okay, can we interpret line drawings? So here is part of a line drawing. And we see some kind of corner there. So if you stare at it long enough, you might see that corner come to you or be away from you and flicker back and forth between the two. Now, if you have certain assumptions about the world, about how things can be compatible, which is true in the real world, not you cannot have all corners next to each other because if something is an edge that's facing you and have a corner on one side, then that edge is still facing you for this corner as well as for the other corner on the other side. So once you have context, it might sell it more in place. Let's say you assume only uh, vertical, horizontal, and uh, yeah, vertical and horizontal lines at 90 degrees. Now it might settle into one specific pattern that's favored for you compared to the other pattern. So how do you formulate this as a CSP? You have variables for um, each intersection. So these are all variables. The constraints are that between these two variables here, they can take on different values in terms of whether they face you or not and so forth, that the interpretation of this edge has to be consistent between those two variables. It has to be a convex or a concave edge in your 3D interpretation of this world. And so that's how you set this up as a CSP. In fact, there's some recent work that looks at this too, where you have soft information rather than hard information that's being imposed. And that's something we'll understand once we look at uh, BaseNets, which is in the second half of this course. Okay, so varieties of CSPs and constraints. We've seen a lot of different examples now. We've seen finite domains um, where we have, let's say, domain size D, n variables, so order d to the n complete assignments, which tends to be a lot for any practical problem, so we need an efficient way to find a satisfactory one. Um, worst case, these problems are all NP-complete, so you cannot guarantee to find a solution efficiently, but often we still can have algorithms that, in many practical cases, nevertheless do well. Um, there are other kind of domains you could consider, maybe the integers as the domain, that would be an infinite domain, or a continuous domain, an interval, or the entire real line. That's all fine, those are still CSPs, but those are not the ones we're going to study in this class. Um, we're gonna restrict ourselves to discrete variables and finite domains. The ideas are somewhat similar for infinite domains. They are actually quite a bit different uh, once you have continuous variables in terms of how you solve them. Okay, we had different types of constraints depending on the problem. The way we're going to classify them is by counting how many variables participate. So a unary constraint is a constraint in which only one variable participates. That's essentially the same as saying the domain is restricted for that variable. Then a binary constraint involves pairs of variables. Note, binary constraint is pairs of variables. You could interpret binary in many ways. You can think binary, oh, the variables can only take on zero, one. That's not what it means. Binary constraint is saying that it's a constraint involving two variables. Higher order constraints involve more than two variables. Okay. You can have soft constraints, we'll look at that later, but just keep that in mind that in principle it's possible to have soft constraints, it would not be a CSP anymore, it would be a slightly different type of problem, but it is possible to consider those two. What are some real world examples that are not puzzles? Okay. Well, assignment problems. Let's say you want a bunch of classes covered by instructors. Who teaches what class? Uh, constraints on how many classes each instructor can teach and so forth. That'd be a uh, constraint satisfaction problem. Timetabling, when you try to fit classes into lecture rooms. So your variables could be each class and then the domain of each variable would be the possible lecture rooms they could be placed into. Could also include the timing. Um, 
Hardware configuration problems can be phrased as CSPs, often transportation scheduling. Um, let's say you want to make sure that certain goods arrive at a certain place, then maybe a truck cannot leave the warehouse before another truck has arrived to deliver the last package that still needs to go in that truck that goes on to the next uh, route. Factory scheduling is quite similar. Circuit layout problems can often be formulated as CSPs. Fault diagnosis problems where you say, well, for any given symptom, there are only a certain set of things that can cause it. Now I see some symptoms, which causes are compatible with the symptoms I'm seeing, and many, many more, many, many more. It is true that many of them take on uh, real values for something like that. What you'd probably want to take is a class like E127, which will study optimization, and then you would look at what happens for real value variables. Let's not, let's not take a look at the discrete problems. So discrete variables. Um, let's take a look at what a standard search formulation would do. We already know how to run search, right? So we can just apply that. States are defined by the values assigned so far, so partial assignment. The initial state is the empty assignment. The successor function is to assign a value to an unassigned variable. And the goal test is whether the current assignment is complete and satisfies all constraints. Okay, let's start with the straightforward naive approach and then work from there. This is not the right way to solve it, but we'll build up from here. Okay, now we have many search algorithms to choose from. We have depth first, breadth first, uniform cost, greedy, A star. We'll still have to pick something there. So let's take a look at what, since there's no costs really, let's look at breadth first and depth first. So what would breadth first search do? on this kind of problem? Well, the search tree would look something like this. We start empty. Then from there, we would call the successor state. The successor function would say, well, one successor has assigned WA equal green. Another successor has assigned WA equal red. Another one has WA equal blue. Then another one has um, NT equals green, and so forth. So you could assign any variable, any value, huge branching factor. Right? Now think about this some more. This will go all the way down, and only all the way at the bottom here will there be full assignments to our variables. Well, remember, in the second lecture, we said there are cases where depth first actually is strictly better than breadth first. This is one of those examples, right? Because you need to go all the way to the bottom anyway. What's the point of going layer by layer by layer and building this huge fringe that has very high memory complexity if you know you need to go to the bottom and check things at, at the bottom before you can ever find a solution anyway? So breadth first is clearly not a good way to get going here. So let's take a different starting point. Depth first search, what would happen there? The search tree would still look the same, but it would traverse it in a different way. So let's take a look at what happens when we run depth first search in this coloring problem over here. Um, closure. So we'll call this naive search in the context of CSPs. Make a simple graph. Don't worry about these settings for now. They're not active. So let's see what happens. So initially, the assignment considered by depth first is empty. Then it essentially calls the successor function, assigns one value to any of the variables, puts that on the fringe. Then we'll look at the first one popped from the fringe, which is this one. Okay. Then it'll call the successor function on this, put a ton of stuff on the fringe. We'll pop the next one from the fringe, which will be this one here. And so we keep traversing here, showing what our depth first search is considering as it's running. Okay. At this point, um, there are no successors anymore, right? There's no variables left to be assigned. Um, so it'll actually look at the next assignment. So we'll kind of backtrack one up in that search tree and look at the next assignment. So we'll say, okay, next thing here is to assign that variable different color, red. Um, then I'll say, well, no successors again. I'll keep going. Let me put this on play. 
Um, and this is what depth first search is considering as it's running its search. Uh, let's make this faster. Let's make this even faster. Even faster. So sped up 16 times, 32 times. Even so, this takes forever to get anywhere. Why is that? I mean, it's doing something really stupid. It actually already got it wrong right here. There's no way it could find a solution by refining anything at the end there. All this work here is useless because once you have two blues next to each other, the goal test is never going to be satisfied. So, um, let's take it out of its misery. And so, what do we see as problems naive search is running into? The first one is, well, it doesn't detect failure early on. It keeps going, calling successor functions, and says like, oh, I haven't satisfied the goal test. But we know that we could already guarantee that no, no successors will ever succeed. So you should just skip that entire subtree. And it's failing to consider that. That's one problem. A second problem is that when you think about it, what do you assign WA, if you assign WA first, and then assign NT, or you first assign NT and then WA. In both cases, what comes below it is going to be the same. So there's no need to consider both orderings of variables in your search tree. And so you can reduce the branching factor in your search tree by, at any level, only considering one variable for assignment, not all remaining variables for assignment. Okay? So once we take this into account, it's called backtracking search. So it's the basic algorithm that probably if you had implemented depth first search and you'd seen it run, you'd say, well, let's not keep going when we already know we're failing and let's only assign one variable in each layer rather than every possible variable in each layer. So first the idea of one variable at a time. Second idea is check constraints as you go. So this allows you, if, because you have more than a goal test theory of this set of constraints, you are able to check if any of them is violated and exit early. Okay. Depth first search with these two improvements is backtracking search, not the best name because you know we could call backtracking is something very specific where you go back up. Um, so everything we'll be seeing is backtracking search, but we'll see versions of it that are um, more advanced. This can solve n queens problems up to n equals twenty five. So let's look at an example of this in action. We expand and we pick one from the fringe. It's really a tie here. You could pick arbitrarily one of those three. Keep going. Anytime along the way, we don't even consider the ones that would violate constraints and we keep going. And this police agent will tell us essentially along the way, um, the consumer satisfaction police says, you already are going to violate a constraint here. No chance for success, just quit this branch down your search tree. All right, so this is what the algorithm formally looks like. It's still depth first search. It's formulated slightly differently here than what we've seen so far. I wanna bring your attention to two kind of particular choice points here. So we're running backtracking search. If we have a complete assignment, we return it. We know we're done, we found the solution. Why? Because we know that we'll never consider a complete assignment if we had some kind of constraint violation, we'd have skipped over it. All right, so if we ever get here at the beginning and the assignment we consider is complete, we're done. If we don't have a complete assignment, we have to pick a variable that we'll assign next. And I haven't told you which variable to pick, just like we had the heuristics in A star, there'll be some kind of cleverness here in terms of picking which variable you wanna do first. We'll look at that later. But you'll have some strategy to pick a variable and for that variable, you loop over all possible values it can take on. And for each value, you'll check, um, does that value viol result in a constraint violation? If it does, let's skip over it. If it doesn't, then we make a recursive call to the backtracking search to go further down with that assignment. Okay, now let's take a look at the same demo we looked at before, but running backtracking rather than naive search. So backtracking here. So what happens now? We step through this, time blue. 
The next thing will not be blue. It knows that that's not useful to go down that path, so it's red, blue here. It kind of keeps going, it makes, already backtrack, backtracks here, realizes that it, it cannot find a solution for that one all the way on the right there, so it's backtracking, tries something else. And so you see that because of it detecting early failure, it knows that it cannot continue. It doesn't go all the way down it used to. And it actually finds a solution in a reasonable amount of time for a very small problem still. Um, okay, let's take a short break here and then let's look at how we can improve backtracking in the second half of lecture. All right, let's restart. Um, how can we improve backtracking? Some ideas we've already referenced. You have a choice point in terms of which variable to choose next for expansion. You have a choice in terms of which values to try next. And then there's something else we'll look at first, which is you might be able to realize earlier than we've looked at so far that you're really going down a dead end with the assignment of values you've chosen so far. So that's called filtering, where you can keep track of whether it's still possible to find the satisfactory assignment during your, on your current path down that search tree. And then next lecture, we'll look at how to exploit structure. So filter, let's take a look at this. So first filtering option is forward checking. So what does forward checking do? Let's say we're considering this graph coloring problem again for Australia. And let's say we assign the Western Australia state as red. Then this is what it looks like. We have red here. But if we forward check, we know that red has to be removed here. Red has to be removed here. These white spots are the consequence of forward checking. It's saying that rather than waiting till we make an assignment to see if constraints are violated, we already know by assigning red that all its neighbors cannot be red, so let's mark it out of their domains and not consider it anymore. Right? Now, you can do this on every assignment. Now we assign green to what is Queensland. So that's this one over here. We can make this one green. We can look at all its neighbors. We're on a forward check. It has three neighbors, NT, SA, and NSW. And green can now be removed from NT, SA, and NSW. And that's exactly what forward checking does for you. This allows you to, now if ever one of these domains becomes empty, to realize that for that variable, there is no assignment anymore that's going to work. So we can already backtrack rather than wait till we realize that only at assignment time of that variable. So this is a way to think ahead in some sense. You don't think all the way ahead, that would require a search, but you think a little bit ahead in terms of what are the remaining values for each domain given what I've already assigned so far by just looking at the neighbors in this case of the val variable that you assign. Let's take a look at what this does in our coloring problem. So we have we're going to work with a different setting here. Let's see. We'll do forward checking. We still have a simple graph. So what happens now? In your algorithm, you keep track of possible values for each variable as you go down your search tree. So initially we assign blue again. We cross out blue from its neighbors. We keep going. Now we assign red. Its neighbors get red crossed out. We go. Um, now blue gets crossed out from that third variable's neighbors. We keep going. Now at this point, a domain becomes empty. We backtrack because we know nothing's going to help anymore to find a solution by completing this. So we backtrack, come up with different assignments. Keep in mind that these domains, of course, get updated as you backtrack. You need to only consider what you've done so far. Um, and in this case, we just 
a couple of backtracking steps, we're able to get all the way to the end. So the amount of backtracking we do is drastically reduced by anticipating how the domains are shrinking as we make assignments and backtracking earlier than we could otherwise. Let's take a look at um, how we can go beyond that. So let's, this was just checking when you make an assignment, look at the other variables participating in a constraint with the current variable and reducing their domains as necessary. Now, we can do more. Um, let's take a look at this situation over here. We have assigned red here, green here. Running forward checking, this is what we currently have as our domains during our search. We see that SA has blue in it and only blue, NT is blue in it and only blue, and they're neighbors. So from looking at this, we already know that going further down this path in the search tree is not going to lead to success. But forward checking doesn't know this because forward checking hasn't made any domains empty. What's happening here is that we're looking at a constraint between two variables, NT and SA. Neither of them has been assigned yet. And forward checking only checks the variables that you assign and does pruning of domains based on that. So we can now do something beyond forward checking if we like, um, which is called constraint propagation or R consistency. And what we do there is we check all constraints that we have and see if there's anything we can prune out of the domains for any pair of variables for a binary problem or any set of variables um, if you have a non-binary CSP where there's more variables in one constraint. So we know this can be blue. We didn't detect it because we just don't do those kind of checks. But um, in constraint propagation, we will do those kind of checks. So what does it mean to check consistency of a single arc? This assumes a binary CSP, meaning only two variables can participate in a single constraint. Well, to check the consistency of an arc, an arc will be directed. In this case, it's an arc from NT to WA. An arc is consistent if and only if for every X in the tail, the tail is this side over here, for every X in the tail, there is some Y in the head which could be assigned without violating a constraint. Okay, what does that mean? Let's look at making this, um, this arc consistent. So this arc here is from NT to WA. We need to check for every X in the tail, which is NT, whether there's some Y in the head which could be assigned without violating a constraint. Well, if NT is red, there's nothing in the head that we can assign. It's already assigned, it's red, and that's incompatible. So. This is not allowed when we want a consistent arc. Green is fine because there's an assignment to the um, head that is consistent, and blue is fine because there's an assignment in the head that is consistent. Let's go to the next one. Um, same thing here. Let's see, actually no, Queensland is not neighboring WA, so any value is fine. Um, now, the picture to keep in mind is that anytime we do this, you always pull things out of the trunk the back of your arrow, okay? So forward checking enforces consistency of arcs. Only those arcs pointing into the assignment you just made. Our consistency will enforce consistency for every arc, not just arcs into the assignment variable you just made. Okay, so remember the lead from the tail. Let's say we're at this stage over here. Let's make sure all arcs are consistent. So here's an arc. We're going to consider all of them, right? So let's consider this arc, V2 and SW. We remove from the tail. So we look at all values in the tail and see if they're still plausible. Is red still plausible? Yes, because it's compatible with blue. Is green still plausible? Yes, because it's compatible with either blue or red. Is blue still plausible? Yes, because it's compatible with red. Um, so we're all good for V. We can't get anything out of that domain. Keep that in mind, we consider this particular arc, nothing was removed from V. Now let's consider this arc over here, SA to NSW, the neighboring states, so they can't have the same color. Um, 
Is there something, when we pick blue for SA, is there something compatible in NSW? Yes, red. So this arc is consistent. Nothing gets removed when checking consistency of this arc. How about the reverse arc? Remember, we removed from the tail. Actually, for red in the tail, we're okay. But then for blue in the tail, we're not okay, and we remove blue from the tail. Now, let's reconsider that arc we considered in the very beginning. Remember, when we considered it at first, nothing was removed. We're considering it again. Um, for red, is there something compatible in the head? Answer, no. So this time, we do remove red here. For green, it's still good. For blue, it's still good. So we see something interesting emerge here, which is that as you prune domains by enforcing consistency of arcs, you might have to revisit some arcs you already saw in the past. Now, you made consistent in the past, but you might have to revisit them because something got pruned out of the head of that arc, and now maybe something in the tail needs to be removed. So practically speaking here, whenever you remove something, you might need to reconsider every arc going into that variable. Okay. Okay. So this is important. Whenever x loses a value, you need to reconsider every arc going into x. Um, this allows you to detect failure earlier than forward checking because you're checking more about what's still possible down the current search path. Um, you can run this as a preprocessor after each assignment. So after you make an assignment, you can run R consistency where you cycle through all your arcs and some of them multiple times because it's something that removed from a variable you might need to reconsider an arc until they're all consistent. This will have pruned your domains. If any domains became empty, you backtrack because this is down a dead end, and that way you can reduce how far you go down in your search tree along different paths. What's the downside of doing this? Well, it's a lot like what we have with heuristics for A star. If you do something very thorough with your heuristics, in this case, we do something very thorough in terms of checking consistency of values that remain in your domains, you're doing a lot of work while doing that that you're not spending traversing your search tree. So you're trading off computation in terms of traversing your search tree for computation that's happening for checking consistency of your domains. Here's the algorithm. I'm not gonna step through the details, but the thing to keep in mind here is that initially you load all arcs onto your um, queue, and then you pop one arc at a time, prune domains to make that arc consistent. If something does get pruned, you re-put every arc going into that variable onto your queue. Of course, you don't need things twice in the queue, so if it already was there, one appearance is enough. All right. Let's take a look at a video of the app that unfortunately wouldn't run anymore. So what we have here, hopefully this will play. Nice. So what are we looking at here? We're again looking at the uh, N Queen's problem. Um, we see the constraint graph, and what you see in action here is every blue arc is one that's still in the queue for our R consistency algorithm. Every green arc is one that has been made consistent. Whenever you see a flash, that's the one that's being considered to be made consistent. Okay. After we did this, let's see if we can pause this here. So at this point, all arcs have been made consistent, or in some sense been verified to be consistent. Initially, there's nothing you can prune, actually. All the domains stay full. Now we make one assignment, and after the assignment, run arc consistency again. You'll again 
everybody will be on the queue, all the arts, so everything will be blue again. As they get made consistent, they'll turn green. If you see a red flash, it means that something got removed from a domain that resulted in an arc having to be requeued that wasn't in the queue anymore. Okay, so what we see here is we made it an assignment of one to that particular queen, then we run our consistency again. Everybody, all arcs are in the queue. And keep in mind, there's two arcs for each pair of variable, one going each way. And as it starts running its arc consistency algorithm, we see their that edge is being checked, being made green. Now, this edge is being checked. Um, this actually will remove this. That removed values uh, will remove values from B because B cannot be one anymore or two when A is one, and now it's run on the automatic mode where we see flashes of edges or arcs that get checked and they turn green as they get satisfied, or we see a red to blue whenever something gets put back in the queue. All right, so that's how this operates. What are some limitations? What happens if you run R consistency? After you do a full run and every, every arc is consistent, there are a few possibilities. The first possibility is that you have um, only one solution left. What does that mean? Every variable has only one value left. If that's the case, you found the solution. Because all your constraints are satisfied, that's what it means to be R consistent. Every variable has only one value, so you discover the solution. It's possible there are still many solutions left, um, such as, for example, is happening here, and you have to continue your search. So it's part of your search algorithm that you run this after every assignment. It's also possible there are no solutions left down that branch in your search tree, but there are still domains that have more than one value, as shown over here. So keep this in mind, our consistency has all of these three possible outcomes. And typically, it will be um, one of the bottom two where you can't tell yet. There could be multiple solutions left. There could be no solution left. You just know your domains have shrunk and there are still some options to explore. So take a look at what this looks like um, in our demo environment. So let's first reconsider um, the So we'll do a backtracking search. We'll look at forward checking, but we'll look at a slightly more complex graph shown here. And let's run backtracking search with forward checking. So here's how it plays out. Now, if we look carefully here, we know that this is only has green left, this only has green left, but forward checking doesn't bail out at this point. Forward checking just keeps going because it only checks the constraints related to the variables you already assigned not other pairs of variables. So it just keeps going and keeps assigning. And then here it'll say, oh, the domain of the top one is now empty. Let me backtrack. It backtracks, finds a new assignment. Um, and again, it'll realize the domain gets empty at the top left and backtrack. And I'll keep doing this for a while. We know really where it's broken is that at this, after we assign the bottom fourth variable, there's no solution anymore. And so, but it doesn't realize that it keeps going until it finally backtrack, backtracks far enough. Let's put this on. Here it is. It's backtracking just far enough, and now it can get over that hump, and it won't encounter the empty domain at that stage. A little more backtracking at the very end there. Um, but it finds a solution reasonably quickly after it's through that bottleneck. Now let's look, take a look at what happens if we run our consistency. So, this point, 
we've already reduced the domain of this variable over here, even though it's not a neighbor of any of the variables we assign, because that's how our RKCC works. It looks at all constraints and propagates throughout. And so we see that that problem of having green left there is not going to be an issue. We actually go straight through this here because it anticipates, it looks further ahead. In fact, in this case, it goes almost all the way through without needing any backtracking. Um, needs a little bit of backtracking here. And there it is, it found a solution with backtracking only minimally, okay? Um, let's look at the last two slides here for today's lecture. So what's left? We can still, still choose in which order we expand values. The idea here is first choose the one with the minimum remaining values. So you have those domains, your filter says how many values are left. Choose the one with the minimum values left. Why is that a good option? In the coloring problem, you'd always pick neighbors of things you already colored. It actually will allow you to have a smaller branching factors. Because you look at variables with very few options and you have very little branching compared if you pick the variable with all options still open. So that's a good thing in terms of having a smaller search tree overall. So this is a fail fast ordering. Now, when we choose values, we want to do it the other way, we want to go the other way around. So what's going on when we choose values? We're going to have to consider all values at that point, choice point in the algorithm. In the best case, the first one we choose will lead to a success and we're done. So that's what we're hoping for. So how do we optimize for maximizing our chances for success? You pick that value that after assigning it, you run your R consistency or you run your forward checking. There are maximally number of options left for the other variables because that means you have a maximal chance of success going down that part in the search tree. So that's good if there is a solution. If there's no solution down that path in the search tree, then it doesn't matter which order you pick. You'll have to go through all of them and reach the dead end for all of them before you're done. So when we pick values, if there's no solution, it doesn't matter. If there is a solution, we want to go down the path with the solution first if we can. And this is a way to maximize our chances to get there in an earlier choice rather than a later choice. Okay? Um, let's just say that this allows you to solve problems of this a thousand queens, and next time we'll start looking at how to exploit structure in the CSP graph to get even faster solutions.